Shalom Chavrim, I'm Steve Benun. You are listening to Identifying the Messiah here on Hebrew Nation Radio, and it is uh, another exciting week, and no doubt this will be a two-part message as well, just like uh, the last broadcast we did, and of course it also aired on the Noon Institute. Uh, on our YouTube channel, and uh, I, I am glad to, to let you guys know that Hebrew Nation Radio is going to help us get the podcast put together, so those of you that are following these broadcasts that are more than one week, uh, you'll be able to go back and look up Identifying the Messiah, and you'll be able to follow uh, the different broadcasts that we are doing uh, here. And as well, we like to load these up on Dunoon Institute on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can get the visual uh, aspect of this uh, broadcast, which I think will be a blessing to many of you that like to watch what's going on. And, uh, and today we're going to go into how that David, the story of David, and more specifically, David and Absalom type the coming Messiah, not just the coming Messiah, but type Yeshua, Jesus Christ, the Messiah himself of 2,000 years ago. And uh, I think it's going to be an interesting broadcast we're going to get into today. So I trust it's going to be a blessing uh, for you, those of you that are listening. And uh, so let's get ready for this broadcast and, and uh Go right into it. So, if you happen to have a Bible and you're and you're uh, following along by radio, uh, turn into Second Samuel chapter 15. That's where we're going to start this at, and uh, then we're going to carry on over into Obadiah. We'll be looking at Obadiah a little bit, maybe a little bit into Daniel's prophecy. At least I'll speak about Daniel's prophecy, uh, whether it be this week or next week, if you're catching it on Hebrew Nation Radio. So, <clears throat> getting started here. We're going to look at the scripture here in 2 Samuel, of course, chapter 15. It starts off by saying, It came to pass after this that Absalom prepared him a chariot before uh, and horses and 50 men to run before him. Uh, actually, maybe I should back up a little bit. If, if we go back into the history of what happens, what brings Absalom on the scene, I suppose we'd have to go back to uh, around uh, chapter 13, I believe it is of the story uh, of David and Absalom, his son, who had the sister Tamar, uh, or Tamar. And Tamar, as we know, is uh, raped by Amnon, uh, his brother, his half-brother, uh, of course, by a different mother than what uh, Absalom and Tamar had. But as a result of this, Absalom looked for revenge. And he ends up killing Amnon for raping his sister. And, of course, that uh, brings in a, a really serious family problem. Absalom has to flee the presence of his father. He fears that his father will take revenge on him and kill him uh, for killing Amnon. Uh, and after uh, two years of his exile, through a, a little... Uh, plot there with the king there. Uh, they, they caused uh, King David to bring Absalom back home to Jerusalem. But even though he does come back home to Jerusalem, there's still, there's no, um, uh, there's no direct communication between King David and uh, that of Absalom. He's, he comes back, but still there's no uh, no communication with his son. Uh, he kind of leaves him uh, abandoned. But Absalom, though, was kind of interesting as I look at the story because Absalom began to take advantage of this uh, and gain the favor of the people. He's a very cunning and, and, and sly guy, and uh, he wanted to be king. And I bring these things up because there is one true son of David, as it's prophesied in Scripture, and that son of David was going to be none other than Jesus Christ. Uh, Yeshua HaMashiach, and I, I, I know some people may not like it when I use this name Jesus Christ, 
but uh, hey, you have no idea what's really going on in the background. It's important that we clarify when we say Jesus Christ that we are truly talking about the Son of God that came uh, and revealed himself to Israel 2,000 years ago. Uh, so I have to kind of put that in there because of some of the very crafty, sinister plots that are going on around the globe right now. Uh, and, and in fact, this very story tells that tells that almost prophetically. There has always been someone that wanted to put himself in the place as David's son, and though they may be related to David by a physical birth, it doesn't mean that they are the prophesied son of David that was going to come, the Mashiach, as he is referred to, by some, some. In fact, Yeshua asked the famed question about uh, to the Pharisees. He asked them, uh, "Who's who? Do, what do you say of David's son? Whose son is he?" And of course, they say he's the Messiah. And uh, uh, and then of course, uh, Yeshua says, "Well, then why then does David call him my Lord?" In spirit, there. So they didn't ask him any more questions. But Absalom, though, is a, really a prime case, something that needs to be looked at. And I want to look at this in the context, as I've done in the past, uh, with the Pope of Rome and what he did back in, I believe it was 2014, as well as what's going on today amongst many of the Talmudic, uh, uh, I should say extreme Talmudic circles, where they are looking for the coming of the Mashiach ben David, they are still looking for a coming Messiah. And oddly enough, this is being even spoken about amongst Messianic believers. Looking for the coming of Mashiach ben David. And they're not looking at Jesus Christ, the Messiah, to be that fulfillment. So to me, it's another case of Absalom. Someone trying to take the place as the anointed son of David that has no business in that position. So anyway, as we look at the story, what happens with Absalom? We read here in chapter 15, and it came to pass after this that Absalom prepared him a chariot and horses and 50 men to run before him. And Absalom used to rise up early and stand beside the way of the gate, and it was so that when any man had suit which should come to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Oh, what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is of one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man to depute it of the king to hear you. Uh, Absalom said, Moreover, oh, that I were made a judge in the land, that every man who hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and would do him, and I would do him justice. And it was so that when any man came nigh to prostrate himself before him, he put forth his hand and took hold of him and kissed him. I, I, I'll tell you what, friends. I used to really be staunchly Pope Vatican all the way is the only way this was being a type knowing though that the scripture has compound fulfillment and compound meanings and I still believe that the Pope of Rome also is a type of Absalom here but I'm also realizing too that this could be on a level of some of the extreme Talmudists that are looking for the Mashiach ben David uh, today, what we're seeing, especially when it talks about, oh, that I were made a judge in the land. Any of you guys familiar with the seven Noahide laws, which are Talmudic, they're not scriptural. Although there are some that are trying to say they are scriptural, they are not scriptural. In fact, if anything, they're Masonic. And the Masonic, uh, if you go back, well, of course, the Talmud had it before then. It was under uh, Rambam who first uh, wrote about these uh, Talmudic laws uh, called the Seven Noahide Laws. Uh, and uh, he writes about that in his writings, uh, uh, Rambam, uh, and uh, under the, um, oh goodness, that is under the, uh, that slips my mind right now, so I don't want to dwell on it. <laughs> so I'll come back to it in a minute when I can recall wh where this is actually written at. But then also, I, a friend of mine sent me a very interesting uh, uh, thing on uh, 
Uh, let me just see if I can find it here real quick. He sent it to me in my email, so I really want to uh, thank the person that did, and I, and I apologize. I don't even have the name of the person in front of me, but they sent to me where the Masons, uh, in one of their books called uh, uh, Prehistoric Masonry, write Noah and the Noahites, uh, found on page 409 and 410. And by the way, uh, I did even deeper research on this, finding out that the, the way this all got started was by two Sephardic Jews that, it, that were part, uh, that had migrated to, to uh, Great Britain during this, uh, after the uh, in Spanish Inquisition. And this is where the Noahide laws were being put together with uh, Freemasonry. But at any rate, I bring this up, though, because of what Samuel, Absalom, he wanted to be a judge. And one of those seven Noahide laws was to establish courts of justice to bring about the seven laws to the descendants of Noah. Right? So anyway, I won't go into that. I won't go into the details of the Noahide laws at this time here, other than to say one thing. If you violate one of the seven Noahide laws, according to the sub-laws in the Talmud, it is the punishment of beheading. Uh, and this is something that if you listen to the uh, chats me and my wife have, Yana Benun, we have these chats called Steve and Yana Chats. Uh, they're also on BitChute. Uh, that's under Israeli News Live on BitChute. Some of those are on our Patreon channel, Israeli News Live. Uh, you can check those out there. We go into much greater detail about that. So I won't waste time here on those particular issues there, other than to say they are actually there. Now, going back to Samuel, though, uh, the other side, as, as I was mentioning, is that Pope Francis was very much like uh, Absalom in the fact, a couple of things here. One, Absalom, when he was in exile away from his father, he was in exile for two full years. Now, it's interesting, since the, since the death of Yeshua, death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua, Jesus Christ, it's been nearly 2,000 years. Now, I find it interesting that Absalom, also for this two-year period, while he was waiting to be restored by his father, He's gaining the hearts and minds of the people. And some might even argue, as a Jesuit pope, that Pope Francis is Jewish to begin with. I don't know if you know this, but he was actually placed into power. They say he was voted in. He was placed into power by some very powerful Chabad Israelis in Israel. That's a deep story all in itself. But at any rate, so Absalom said, And it was so that when any man came nigh to prostrate himself before him, he put forth his hand and took, him, took hold of him and kissed him. Doesn't it sound like with the Pope? When you go before the Pope, they take you, bow down, kiss his pinky finger or the ring on his finger or something like that, right? So... It goes on to say here in, in uh, Samuel, And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Now this is what I'm afraid is happening even today. When Jesus Christ, our Savior and King, should be the one that we have our hearts on, the Son of David... But instead, all the hearts of Israel are being stolen. They're being stolen by a, a false king, an imposter. And I'm telling you right now, there is a major move on in Israel right now and around the world, preparing the people for a Messiah, and it won't be Yeshua. It won't be Jesus Christ. They might call him Yeshua, but he won't be Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Not at all. All right, let me, let me share something with you here. I think you'll find this interesting. Okay, if we go and look, though, just to give you an example of what the Pope of Rome did, right? Back in 2014, the picture, if you're watching this on Israeli News Live, if not, I'll describe it to you there on Hebrew Nation. You, we're looking at a picture of the upper room. The upper room, by the way, is located just above King David's tomb. 
And the Pope of Rome held a mass in that upper room. And when he did, he wore one of those, I call it the fish hat. It looks like a little crown on his head. And in my opinion, he was there putting himself in the place of king of Israel. Sitting above the tomb of David. Now those of you that may not remember this, there was a time when, when uh, Benjamin Netanyahu actually had given an official seat uh, to the Pope of Rome. And there was an article written by Guglielmo Miotti, an Italian journalist, who wrote, writes for Arut Shiva. The title of it was, Exclusive, A Seat for the Pope at King David's Tomb. He says, and a historic agreement has been drafted between Israel and the Vatican. The Israeli authorities have granted the Pope an official seat in the room where the Last Supper is believed to have taken place on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, and where David and Solomon, Jewish kings of Judea, are considered by some researchers to also be buried. So they put the Pope as if he were the king of Israel. And that picture I just shared with our listeners, hey, he's like he's in a, a, his own crown chair sitting on top of the tomb of David as if he were the king of Israel. Well, you see, that's just an outward sign. Now, I will tell you this, and I know that there were a couple of uh, rabbis that picked up my video, and they also spoke on this. Of course, they'd never tell you where they got it from, but... Um, Obadiah, when this happened, I shared with the Jewish world that that was fulfilling what the Pope did in 2014, right around Passover, fulfilled actually two different prophecies. It fulfilled the prophecy of Rebecca. Some people say, Repro Re prophecy of Rebecca? Steve, what are you talking about? Well, there, there were some ministers that actually spoke about this publicly, but they picked it up from something that I'd shared with them about how that when John Kerry started that nine-month negotiations for a two-state solution, that this was actually prophecy in the making. Now, in the beginning, I thought it could be because of a Palestinian state, and then God revealed to me that it wasn't because Rebecca, when she had the uh, when she was having the trouble with the two children in her womb, Esau and Jacob, and they were wrestling with one another. And she goes before the Lord and she asks God, she says, why am I thus? Why is this happening to me, in other words? And God said, because there are two manners of people, two nations are in your womb. And when they come out, they will be separated from the womb. Esau and Jacob. Any Jew will tell you that Israel or excuse me, Rome, the Vatican, is represented as Esau. Of course, Israel being Israel. And when there was this nine-month negotiations, it was interesting, after the nine months were finished, the article came out, I think it was in the New York Times, it says something to the effect, a title that stated something like, uh, the nine-month negotiation ends in failure. No, it didn't. You see, it's just like it was in the case of Shimon Perez and the, the, the Camp David meetings that were going on. Uh, that was only the red herring in the room as um, Barry Chamish and uh, also um, Joe Bainerman reported years ago. The real meeting that was going on was a secret meeting between the Vatican and Israel and the Pope of Rome to be able to get certain holy sites in Israel. That was the real meeting. Same thing with this situation with the nine-month negotiations. The real two-state solution was giving under what Netanyahu called Halakha law. He approached the rabbi over the, uh, over the uh, David's tomb to give a Halakha law, which is like giving a portion to the Vatican. And so the Vatican was given that portion as theirs. And of course, he goes to Mount Zion. He sits in that seat. And this happened less than 30 days after this so-called negotiations failed. 
And it just goes to show the negotiation did not fail, but yet rather was a success. Obadiah recorded it like this. Okay, for as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the nations drink continually. Yea, they shall drink. Okay, and swallow down. That goes on to say, and shall be as though they had not been. It's in masculine plural. Ki ka'asher shutetem. It was men only drinking. And in the case of the Pope of Rome, it was men only that drank that day. What was the Pope of Rome doing? Like Absalom. Gaining the hearts and the minds of the people. Well, we would think that that's what he's doing, right? Not necessarily everybody was for the hearts and the minds of the people there, right? We also have, like we can see here on the screen and behind me, there were a lot of Orthodox Jews protesting the Pope of Rome on Mount Zion. Why? Because you have to understand, the Pope of Rome, to them, is not Moshiach ben David. He is not the coming Messiah of David. But even so, it doesn't make any difference. Some of the extreme Talmudic community are still going to try to manufacture a prophecy. They're not interested in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Just like in the case of Absalom, if we go back to chapter 15, and we read on, and, and on this manner, verse 6, and, and this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king of judgment, so Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. And it came to pass at the end of 40 years that Absalom said unto the king, I pray thee, let me go and pay my vow, which I have vowed unto the Lord in Hebron. For thy servant vowed a vow, and I abode at uh, Geshur in Aram, saying, If the Lord shall indeed bring me back to Jerusalem, then I will serve the Lord. The king said unto him, Go in peace. So he arose and went to Hebron. But Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, then you shall say, Absalom is king in Hebron. You notice what Absalom did? He was very sneaky in what he was doing. First off, Absalom didn't have the revelation that his father was a king. Totally had no revelation. Similar to that of Israel today. They have no revelation that Jesus Christ was indeed the fulfillment of the prophecy of the son of David. The Lord thy God will raise up a prophet like unto me, of even what was spoken to Moses. Or the... Uh, Mashiach Nagi, the anointed prince that Daniel spoke about that would come. They have no revelation of that. And so therefore, whether it be the Pope of Rome trying to take this position, or whether it be uh, the Orthodox community still looking for a coming Messiah because their eyes have not opened as of yet, they're all trying to manufacture the prophecy. They're all trying to win the minds and hearts of uh, the people. And it's just not working. This is what Absalom tried to do as well. All right? But what I find fascinating is that the story of David, as we read on, so much types that of Christ. You see, as David began to do this rebellion, and he sounded, you know, like I said, he sent out the spies to what all the tribes of Israel. That's what's happening today. The state of Israel has sent out spies inside the churches all through the tribes of, why do I say the tribes of Israel? Because amongst many of the organizations today all over the globe, whether they be Pentecostals, whatever they might be, in South America, the United States, many of the, and even the Hebrew Roots Movement, you name it, Messianic Movements, there are many believers in Christ already. But you see, Absalom is not satisfied with you recognizing 
who David's son really is. He wants to be the king. So he sends out spies. He's already won the hearts and minds of the people. He already has you convinced that the secular state of Israel, someone like even Netanyahu, is anointed of God to do what he does. But yet we have all the gay parades and everything else. We have a sodomite city. We have everything that is ungodly you could possibly imagine in the state of Israel. The worst abortion laws on the books in the entire planet. And that's supposed to be an anointed king? You would think people could have saw through Absalom, but they didn't. Why? He had already stole their hearts away. So the people were blind to the word of God. Instead, they could only see the man, Absalom, because of his beauty and what he convinced them that he was there for. And that's the way it is today. It's no different. Modern day Absalom has stolen away the hearts and minds of the believers on a global scale. Because why? They also sent spies in amongst you to get you to go along with Absalom's plan. You know what's funny? His very name means my father is peace. Absalom. His own father's, his own name speaks of his father and he, don't, he still doesn't get it. What, what can you figure? But anyway, so, uh, you know, a conspiracy builds. And it goes on to say, and with Absalom went 200 men out of Jerusalem that were invited and went into their simplicity and they knew not anything. So see, there's some people they just don't even know. They, they're just simple-minded. They love God. They think that this is a good thing and they just don't even know. And Absalom sent for Ahithophel, the Gileanite, David's counselor from his city, and even Gilo, while he offered the sacrifices, and the conspiracy was strong for the people increased continually with Absalom. I see this same type of conspiracy happening today. Not just with the Pope of Rome, but don't kid yourself, the Pope of Rome is also, there are many people that wanted to take the, the seat of David. Absalom is just one of them. And there came a messenger to David saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. And David said unto all his servants that, that were with him at Jerusalem, Rise and let us flee, for else none of us shall escape from Absalom. Make speed to depart, lest he overtake us quickly and bring down evil upon us, and smite the city with the edge of the sword. The king's servants said unto the king, Behold, thy servants are ready to do whatsoever my lord the king shall choose. The king went forth and all his household after him. And the king left ten women that were concubines to keep the house. And the king went forth and all the people after him. And they tarried in Beth uh, Merhach. And all his servants passed on beside him. And the, and the Carathites and the Pelathites and the Gittites, 600 men that came after him from Gath, passed on before the king. Then said the king to Ittai the Gittite, Wherefore goest thou also with us, return and abide with the king, for thou art a foreigner, and also an exile from thine own place. Whereas thou camest but yesterday, should I this day make you go and to down with us, seeing I go whither I may? Return thou and take back thy brethren and, and with thee and, be, and show kindness, excuse me, with thee and kindness and in truth. All right. Now the point that I wanted to get to you there. As you read on down, we find out that David, he'll cross the Kidron Valley. He's going to go up on the other side of the mountain, and he's going to stoop down. He's going to weep over Jerusalem just like Yeshua did. And like that of Yeshua, Jesus, that is, what happened there too? Another thing that I thought was very interesting, and that is that when Yeshua was here, not only did he weep over Jerusalem, but when Peter, when they came to take Yeshua, Peter pulled out his sword, cut off the high servant's uh, priest, the, the, the servant of the high priest, cut off his ear. Yeshua heals his ear and says to David, put away your sword. He said, could I not straightway call ten legions of angels and my father would, would give them to me if this was my kingdom? You see, David didn't want to fight. And Yeshua didn't either because that wasn't the kingdom he came to fight for. But David went over 
He wept over Jerusalem, just like Yeshua did. And he said, how often I would have hovered you as a hen with her own brood, but you would not. And I've always held, too, that those ten concubines represented the ten virgins that we read about in the New Testament. Five wise and five foolish. You notice, though, what happened to those ten virgins? They were abused. Absalom abused them in the sight of all Israel. And yet those ten virgins represented the believers of Yeshua. Another interesting thought. One other thing I want to share with you as well, and we'll close with this here in just a moment. I'll go deeper into these things later, but I'll share with you as well. When David, after he got through weeping over Jerusalem, you know, he crosses over, the, he goes down towards the Jordan. Saul's son, Shemai, meets David along the way, spitting on him, throwing rocks at his men, angry because he said David took the kingdom from his father Saul. David's men wanted to cut his head off. You remember how they spit on Yeshua too? David said, let him alone. God told him to do that. And the other thing is too, when David returned, like I guess I'll just cut this short for now, but when David returned, what happened? Shimei met him down at the river. If we look at Zechariah's prophecy, in Zechariah, when all, when they recognize the one whom they thrust through, the one that they pierced, his side, which is none other than Yeshua, Zechariah tells us in chapter 12 that they begin to mourn and weep as a family that lost their only son. And when they begin to separate each one to their own houses, we don't get a tribal order, even though it's obvious it's the house of Judah. We get David and Nathan and his house apart and their wives apart. And then we get one more. Besides the Levites, we also get the family of the house of Levi apart, their wives apart, and the family of the Shemites apart and their wives apart. You know, Shemai was a Benjamite. Even in the times of Jesus, he was a Benjamite. And I find it interesting that under the family names and the fulfillment of prophecy, Shemai is noted in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 13. There's so many places that reveal that Yeshua is the Messiah. I'm Stephen Benoon with Israeli News Live or Danun Institute here. Hebrew Nation Radio talking about identifying the Messiah. Shalom.